Thank you very much, and welcome everyone to Cute World Summit 2017. Um, we're going to have a brief talk today about what's new in Cute 3D. Um, I think there's another talk after this by my colleague Paul, who's going to talk about an application of using Cute 3D to render the Earth. And then there's Laszlo's talk at the end of the day about uh, making the Cute 3D Studio runtime, also on top of Cute 3D. So lots of 3D stuff today. So let's have a quick look. And we're first of all, going to start off with what was new in um, 5.8 and 5.9. We'll then have a look at what's coming up in 5.10, and finally we'll have a brief word about some of the ideas we've got for the future as well. So without further ado, one of the highlight features for me in 5.9 was the incorporation of the physics-based rendering shaders. Now these are much nicer than the old Fong-based shaders that we had before, um, and these are much easier to control as well. So you may not have seen the details of this, but if you want to see all the gory details, I did a talk on this at last year's World Summit, which is available on the internet. Um, the idea is basically the shaders now much more accurately model how light interacts with matter. And they can be controlled with intuitive properties such as like a base color and how metallic a surface is and how rough the surface is. In Cute 5.9, these are presented as a pair of materials. So there's the Q metal rough material, which allows you to set constant properties across the whole surface um, for the base color, uh, metallic level, and roughness. And then there's also the textured metal rough material, which allows you to use textures for these inputs, as well as providing the option for you to specify a normal map as well, and also an ambient occlusion map. Now, to get the nicest results with this, you don't just want to use point lights or directional lights. Um, it's actually nice to use something that we've introduced called the Q environment light. So this gives you very nice looking reflections, um, both for shiny and rough looking surfaces. Um, there's a little bit of work involved in generating the textures for these, but if you want to know the details, come and grab me afterwards. Um, there's a couple of nice tools one for generating the textures for the environment light, um, called NALD LIS, or LICE. And the other one is for actually generating the textures on the object themselves, uh, which is the substance tool set by Algorithmic, which is really, really highly recommended you take a look at. So just to show an example of that running, if my laptop will cooperate. And there we go. So here we have that example we just have on the slide. And if you catch the angle of the light just right, you can hopefully see there's some scratches and things, surface imperfections on the top there. Now, they are made very easily inside this Substance Painter tool. And all they're doing there basically is modulating the surface roughness so that they reflect light in a slightly different way. But this is the kind of detail that makes things look a lot more realistic to the human eye. Also, yep, we've got Q Skybox now, which makes it trivial to add in a surrounding uh, environment map as well. Something else that's new in 5.9 was the ability to integrate any legacy painting code that you might have. So if you're updating your applications to incorporate 3D content, chances are you have some legacy Q Painter code laying around from your um, widget painting or any other custom graphics view painting that you've had in the past and you now want to be able to use that inside your 3D scene. Now, the Qt 3D, to get um, images onto an object, will typically use something called Qtexture 2D. So what we need is a bridge to go from QPainter to Qtexture 2D, and that's provided by this guy called QPainter Texture Image. Uh, the use of this is actually really simple. You just inherit from it, you override the paint function, and inside there you use um, Q-Painter to do your normal painting, just like you would with any other widget or anything. And once you've done that, that texture image is then made available to be used as one image with inside a Q-Texture 2D object, or in fact, any other texture type. And you can do this from either C++ or QML. So let's have a quick look at that, if I can find the example. Bear with me a second. 
uh, painted texture. Oh, that's not the one I was expecting. I'm looking in the wrong place. Sorry. It's this one. Okay, so here we have a 3D window that's got a simple cube on it. And then inside this window, it's just a typical cube widget scribble window. We can start painting on it. And your texture then appears on all faces of the cube. So to do that is actually pretty simple. Uh, where was it? Bear with me one second. So on the QML side, basically we just have an entity that contains a cuboid mesh, the transform, a diffuse matte material, which is one of the old style materials, but we could have used the metal rough material if we like. So we could have been actually painting a roughness texture. And here we're just instantiating a texture 2D object, setting up some filtering mode, and telling it to generate some mip maps for us. And finally, the image that we're making part of our texture is this scribble texture image here. And if we dive back into the C++ side, we can see that's actually very easy to generate. So all we do is we inherit from cube painted texture image. We have a paint function. And inside the paint function, all we're doing is just using the provided cube painter. And we're drawing a cube painter path in this case. But there's nothing in there stopping you from calling cube widget render or um, getting the output of a graphics view or whatever else is you want to do. And then you can embed your widget or graphics view or other painted content into your 3D scene. The thing this doesn't do for you is forwarding the input events back into your widgets that you're rendering. So if you want that at the moment, you need to implement that part yourselves. But that's something we're thinking about adding in the future. However, if you want to embed Qt Quick inside Qt 3D, you can also do that. The way we do that is we use this guy called Scene2D. And this is actually provided by a module called QQuick.Scene2D. Uh, and it takes a QQuick item as a child, which represents your 2D content you want to put in your 3D world. And then behind the scenes, this gets rendered into a frame buffer object, which in Qt3D is represented by this guy, render target output. And we can set the exact target with the output property, as I'll show you an example in a second. The resulting texture that gets rendered by our Qt Quick 2 scene can be used inside any material that you care, and on as many objects as you wish as well. Now, unlike with the um, painted texture image, this does also actually allow you to forward events back into the Qt Quick 2 scene. So we can render a Qt Quick 2 scene into a texture, apply it to a 3D object, and then actually click on the 3D object and have the events forwarded back into Qt Quick so they can interact with the mouse and keyboard. And that's actually quite nice. The gotcha for that is you do need to specify the entities that you want to forward input from in the entities property of the scene 2D object. And we need to be using triangle-based picking rather than the default bounding sphere picking because we need to know exactly where on the object the user clicked. So a quick example of that one is this. So what we've done is we've taken the same game Qt Quick application that ships with the Qt um, examples, as has done for many, many years now. And we've applied it to a texture. And then we're using that texture on the side of a 3D object. So we've made like a little virtual Game Boy or something with same game. OK, and just to prove it, you can actually click on this thing. The animations work, and you can click on things. You get the particle effects, and you can actually play the game as normal. Yeah, you can click on the menu, get back to the start screen. So that's actually quite a nice thing to have. So now you can use Qt Quick 2 for making your 2D content, which you can then apply to 3D billboards or whatever it is you have in your 3D scene. Perhaps you want to make a user interface using Qt Quick and then use it in an AR stroke VR application rendered with Qt3D. 
And the code for that is actually pretty simple. OK, so in our main.qml, we start off with some cute 3D stuff. So we've got entities and things. This one here is literally just drawing the ground. And then we have our scene 2D. Now, the bulk of this is actually just setting up the texture that we wish to render the scene 2D object to. So that goes into the output property of that. We specify which color attachment we want it to go to because the render target outputs can actually render multiple things at the same time to multiple outputs. Um, and this guy is just setting up a kind of default color texture. Yeah, we specify the width and the height of the texture we want to render into, and we give it an ID so we can refer to it later. We're also asking the GPU to generate MIP maps for us so that if your 3D object is very far away from the camera, you're not going to get horrible aliasing effects. OK, and that is all done on the GPU for you. We then have the entities property where we list the entities that we want to receive input from. We're enabling the mouse. And then as a child, we have our 2D content. Now, this is exactly the QML from the same game example stolen from the Qt 3D examples. So just to prove it, it's all standard Qt Quick. There's nothing changed in there at all. So it's very easy to wrap this up. So this is generating our texture. And then down here, we have an entity grouping a couple of things. The first one is the actual body of the Game Boy Cube. And then we have another entity that represents the screen. So we're just using a flat plane. We give it a transform, a material, and inside the material for the diffuse texture, we're using the off-screen texture that was output by the scene 2D element. And just so we have an event source, for feeding the input back into the same game, we have an object picker. And that's all you have to do. Yep. So that's not a bad return on investment in terms of number of lines of code you need to write to be able to embed any Qt Quick inside a Qt 3D scene. Next up is level of detail. So the idea is rendering very complex 3D objects is more expensive than we want to pay the price for, especially when the 3D object is very far away from the camera and only occupies a few pixels on the screen. So we want to get rid of complex objects when things are far away and just render the complex ones when they're close to the camera. So when things are far away, we can switch to a simpler representation. It might just be a, a lower poly mesh. It might be using simpler textures or smaller textures. It might be a complete fake imposter. Yeah, it might just be a 2D sprite of your 3D object that when it's so far away, nobody can tell the difference. We can support all of those things. So we have a new component called level of detail. And then there's a helpful wrapper around that called level of detail loader, which basically just combines the level of detail component for switching between different entities along with a loader. So you can actually dynamically load the ones you need on the fly. And then you can control when and how it switches between the different levels of detail, either based upon the distance from the camera or on the projected screen size. And it's very easy to use. So I'll just quickly show you a tiny example for that one. So sole level of detail. There we go. So here we have a little Viking guy. And this is quite a high poly mesh. And if I move the camera further away, a little bit at a time, where is it? There we go. It's switched onto the next level of detail down. Yep, did you see it change a bit? Now, we can see it changing because I've artificially set the threshold at which it changes artificially close to the camera. In a real application, you'd have it far enough away that you can't really see the difference between the two. And if I keep moving further away, eventually it goes to a really low poly mesh where he's just got basically a couple of triangles for fingers. Yep. And the code for that one. Uh, so level of detail. Pretty easy. So we have an entity where we've got a property containing the three um, levels of detail for our meshes. We have a mesh component, and the source property basically just switches upon um, that array of meshes. 
and the selector is basically just the level of details current index property. And then the level of detail object itself, the component there, is just this guy. So we tell it which camera it should work out the distance from, or the um, projected screen size from. We tell it where the thresholds are, the distances, and which type of threshold to use. In this case, it's the distance. And that is all you have to do. Yep. The level of detail loader is just the wrapper around that that allows you to specify separate QML files rather than actually managing the meshes yourself. We can have 3D geometric text nowadays as well. And basically, there's a couple of ways of doing this. You can use the extruded text geometry if you want to manage the rendering yourself. Or you can use the helper extruded text mesh, which basically does everything for you. Use it like any other piece of geometry or geometry renderer. And we can obviously control the font and the text properties along with the depth of the actual extrusion as well. Oops, let me just show you that one. So we have text 3D, running that one. There we go, it's just a simple scene that's got some 3D text in it. Yep, it's not particularly pretty, but it just illustrates the point we can have 3D text generated from a string inside of a 3D scene. So the details of that one, just very briefly, where has it gone? Oh, it's inside the pot entity. And yeah, here we go. So we have an entity in here somewhere, and we're just using the extruded text mesh, and we set the text property, and it's using the default font, and we tell it how much you want to extrude. And in this case, we then just have a transform and a material on it as well. But what material you set on it is up to you. You could use the metal rough material. You could use the um, simple ones, like this Fong material. That's your call. We're just making the facilities available. It's up to you what you do with it. And then, very similarly, we have a um, distance field text facility now as well, so just like Cute Quick. Um, it's provided by a text 2D entity. It basically renders distance field text into a texture and then puts that on a textured plane. So you can have 2D text in your scene as well very easily. Yep. A helpful one is a new frame graph node. So the frame graph is this guy that allows you to actually customize the rendering algorithm that's used. And um, the new type in here is the render capture node which allows you to effectively take screenshots or captures of intermediate stages of rendering, as well as, of course, the final scene. So very brief look at this one. So we've got Sol screenshot, just to show you an action. I won't bother showing the code at the moment because we're running a bit short of time today. But here we have a simple scene where we can click on objects to select them or deselect them and they get highlighted with a green blurred outline that's overlaid over the top. And I can capture either just the selected objects or the blurred version of that as well. You saw they get slightly bigger when they're blurred. Or we can actually capture the final render as well. So this is very, very handy for debugging the intermediate stages of your rendering algorithms, as well as for capturing traditional screenshots. So it's dead easy to use. It's called QRender Capture. Ooh. Yeah, get rid of that. Um, there's also another little helper um, called Axis Accumulators, which actually integrate the um, input devices as a function of time on the back end. It saves you having to have a per frame, per frame callback to the front end and doing it on the main thread yourself. So that's just Axis Accumulator play around with it. You can treat the axis input values as either uh, velocities or accelerations. And then moving on to 5.10, briefly. Um, there's a whole bunch of animation stuff that made it into 5.9 as well, which I haven't put slides on because I've got a whole talk on it tomorrow. But just mention briefly, um, skeletal animations. There was a chap asking about that in the previous talk. Q3D can now do skeletal animations as well. Um, so it allows animating parts of an entity, and they can be either organic in nature so that they bend and stretch, or they could be rigid body. It depends how you set the skeleton up and the mapping to the joints. But come and see the talk tomorrow. There's lots of cool stuff to come with that. 
So there's a few new types of working with skeletons and armatures and joints and things. Uh, yep, shameless plug. And just for a very quick look, show you what's coming. So there we go. There's a skeletal animation of a, a walking robot. Yep, so come along tomorrow and we'll go through all the details of how to make something like that and see how easy it is to do it in Qt3D. It's very simple now. Right, um, materials. Now, materials, they suffer from a combinatorial explosion if you have similar inputs. So an input might be a constant, it might be a texture. Um, there's many, many variations on a theme for materials as well, where you just want a small tweak. And people often don't like writing raw GLSL code. It's a bit scary if you're new to it. So we've come up with this idea of shader graphs as a higher level abstraction for making materials. So this allows you to work with the concepts and let the people who write the shader graph nodes worry about the low-level details about converting it to GLSL. So here's an example of the sort of typical graph for the metal rough material. And as you can see on the left hand side, we have the various inputs. So we've got like the world space position of a vertex or a fragment, the eye position, which is where the camera is in world space. And we subtract those from each other and normalize it. And that gives us our view vector. And that feeds in as one of the inputs to the metal rough node. We've got other inputs as well. So the world position also feeds in directly as well as the base color, the metallic level and the roughness level. And that's fine, we have a material. But now we want a slight variation on that. So we could change the graph very slightly, where we now have a texture coordinate passed in that allows us to sample from a heat map texture. For example, if you're doing sort of thermal simulations, and we can then use that texture to convert from a temperature to a color that represents our heat. That now feeds into our metal rough node, but other than that, the graph is exactly the same. So what we're coming up with now is we've got the shader graph concept in place and we can generate shaders from structures like this. And we're now working on a graphical editor to allow you to draw out graphs like this and that will generate the code for you. So we've got an early proof of concept of that in-house already. We'll hopefully push that upstream as soon as it's ready and stabilized a bit. But we can already get live previews inside a Qt3D window using this graph editor as well. So that's a really nice thing. It's private API inside of Qt GUI because we could potentially share this with Qt Quick in the future as well for custom materials or graphical effects there. And it's exposed as one public type in Qt3D called Shader Builder, which you can play around with now if you like. All right, we'll just skip that. It's already in use for the um, materials in 5.10. And then there's sprite sheets that are basically allow you to step through um, sub images of a big texture as a function of time. And then there's sprite grid and sprite sheet allows you to define if it's a regular grid or um, your own layout of items inside your texture atlas. So do have a play around with that. You can change the index and it will automatically swap which part of the texture you're displaying. And then there's a few helpers. So Q camera view all allows you to view the whole scene easily. Um, mesh and texture load and now support remote URLs as well as local files. And then points and lines and can be picked by object picker. And then we've got a whole bunch of optimizations, including a lot of work on using SIMD instructions in the renderer for a nice factor of four speed up in lots of the operations that we do there. All right, yeah, we'll skip that bit. And then for the future, obviously we want better documentation, especially with task oriented pages. Um, more examples, especially we need a solution for how to handle large assets because we don't want that right beside the source code in the Git repo. And then more performance, bug fixing, and improving the existing aspects. And importantly, VR and AR support. There's already a proof of concept patch on Garrett for this, so please do give it a try. Let us have some feedback and hopefully some improvements. And Paul, my colleague, who's talking after this, is also working on Vulkan support as the renderer backend for Qt3D as well. And finally, yeah, we're looking at tooling for all of those things. And also better feedback from the engine when things don't go quite to plan. So you can find out actually what's gone wrong in your scene. 
So yeah, so far we've got a pretty good set of features, and we're now focusing on stability, performance, and convenience for you to get your stuff done. Thank you, and any questions? Hi. Um, this is all brilliant and great features. Thank you very much for uh, talking you. about this. Um, so one of uh, the uh, requests that we, that we have from our clients is, OK, uh, can we use this behind remote desktop? So uh, how does uh, all this 3D, uh, new 3D work um, degradate, degrade, or um, yep. cope with non-accelerated graphics and remote desktop or something like that? OK, um, with non-accelerated graphics, you're pretty much out of luck unless you're using something that basically renders things as a bitmap and sends that over the wire. Um, if you're using remote desktop that does have hardware acceleration, so like the Windows remote desktop on newer versions of Windows, this should work. Um, but it all depends on the feature set that you're using. Uh, we're not specifying any particular feature set upon you. It's up to you to choose in your application or your own library which level of OpenGL features or eventually Vulkan features you want to use. And that would need to match the level of features supported by the remote desktop. OK, but in theory, if your remote desktop supports GL, there's no reason why this shouldn't work, as long as you don't exceed that feature set. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I like this very much. Well, um, thank you for this. And my question directly connects. It is about the back end. You said, of course, OpenGL, but then Vulkan is supported. What is about WebGL streaming? Is this also possible or not yet? So into the browser, if the browser supports WebGL. Right, in theory, it's technically possible, um, but no one's done any work in that direction yet, other okay. than the standard QPA WebGL streaming that's coming. Um, but in theory, you could write a renderer backend for Q3D that does stream out this stuff to WebGL. OK, so, so in theory, yes, but not yet available. Correct, yeah. Okay. If you want to contribute it, I would be more than happy to speak to you. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm afraid we have yep. to stop here. Thank you. Time is over. Thank you very much.